And to all the organizers and uh, planners at this conference for really putting together a, a, a group of, um, of legal rock stars. And this panel um, is really an all-star panel and I encourage you to read their full biographies. I'm just going to give you a very short identification of each of them. Um, our, this is on federal uh, versus state. Uh, judge McKee is uh, the federal court on the panel, a uh, federal court judge. He serves on the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit, and he served as the chief judge for more than six years. Uh, uh, to my right is uh, our state court judge, uh, Judge Renee Cohn Jubilier, and she serves on the Pennsylvania Commonwealth Court, which is one of our two uh, intermediate appellate courts and relevant to today, she is the co-chair of the Pennsylvania Commission on Judicial Independence, one of the sponsors of today's program. Uh, in the middle here is uh, our lawyer. Uh, Bob Heim is a nationally recognized trial lawyer who practices in federal and state court. And relevant to today, he is a co-founder and current board chair of Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts. Um, my name is Lynn Marks, and I'm going to serve as your moderator. Uh, we encourage you to write down questions, and if we have time, we will um, discuss them. Um, here is a very, very brief primer on how judges are selected uh, for those who are not familiar. As you heard from previous speakers on the federal level, uh, Article 3 of the U.S. Constitution states that uh, the, the president nominates uh, federal judges. They are confirmed by the Senate, and they serve for good behavior, which is typically for life. Uh, state court judges are selected in a variety of ways. Uh, election, either partisan or nonpartisan. Uh, appointment, uh, usually by the governor, either without a nominating commission or with the nominating commission, which is often referred to as merit selection. Uh, a, a appointment by the legislature, all that, fortunately, that is very uncommon, uh, or a combination of these methods, such as uh, an appointment and then an election, and then some states have uh, a different method for uh, picking uh, uh, trial court judges or appellate court judges. Uh, selection is usually for a given number of years, depending on the state, uh, very occasionally for life, uh, years ago, I heard somebody from the American Judicature Society to just, who described state judicial selection systems as like snowflakes, that no two are alike. But today, when we talk about state courts, we're going to be focused on Pennsylvania. And in Pennsylvania, uh, trial and appellate uh, court judges are um, chosen in partisan elections, which means that people run on a party line. The term is usually for 10 years, and then after 10 years will uh, uh, stand for what's called a retention election where the voters can decide yes or no whether that judge deserves to stay for a full 10-year term. Uh, and then so on. So there are many topics that we could have uh, focused on with the state versus federal uh, uh, program head. We decided to focus on judicial selection and tenure, public perception of the courts and judicial independence versus accountability. And the previous speakers really are a wonderful uh, introduction to this panel. OK, let's get going. And remember, we decided we weren't going to have any long speeches, right? OK. <laughs> um, OK, so we're going to start with federal judge, with Judge McKee. And you are in a rare situation of having uh, both served on the federal court uh, at the appeals level and on the state court at the trial level. So having lived through and succeeded in uh, uh, getting to both of those courts, I wondered if you would uh, share, um, compare the, the processes, particularly with an eye towards today's topic, fair and impartial courts. Thank you, and I'd be happy to. Both systems, we call it merit selection, and they're those who argue for elected judges would probably say that that's also a merit selection process and the, the you know, people who are casting the ballots um, determine who is most meritorious, but hopefully we're in this room beyond the point where we would accept that. Um, but both systems do involve an element of politics, and if, if we don't accept that, I think we're deluding ourselves. Both the so-called merit selection system that we have in the federal level 
and the uh, local system, and I'll use Pennsylvania as an example, where you run by popular election, uh, both are, are very heavy political. Unfortunately, the federal, se federal system has even gotten more political lately. Um, having said that, I will say, however, that electing judges by popular election is an absolutely horrible way to select judges. It's an abomination. There's not much really good I can say about it. The only thing that the voter cares about uh, are basically the things that you can't talk about. So when you go to ward meetings, which is a whole other topic, um, you ask questions which you can't answer. And those are, of course, the only things that the people in that room want to know, how you would vote on certain things that impact them, but those are things that might come before you so you can't answer the, the question. The problem is, and this was alluded to earlier, that all of us derive our authority really from the acceptance uh, of the uh, public. It's, uh, we don't have the power of the person or the sword, as sort of was, was mentioned earlier. There has to be a culture of compliance and acceptance within the uh, community for judges to do our job. And to the extent that we are seen as not being fair and impartial, the judiciary is seriously undermined and weakened. Electing judges, I think, only goes to undermine that perception. One of the problems is raising money. Uh, I was lucky when I ran in, did I run? 84, I think I ran, 84. Uh, it wasn't at the point that it is now, um, that's at least in Philadelphia, totally out of hand, even at the local common police court money uh, level with raising the money. Um, one example I will give you that happened to me, and this is, I think, not that atypical in terms of how the, quote, merit selection of the public um, election works. Right before I ran for election, when I was running for election, I was fortunate enough to be general counsel of the local um, quasi-governmental authority, which is not unfairly known as a patronage haven. Everybody there was a ward leader or a committee person. And one of the persons who worked next to me, who was the ward leader from a very conservative, all-white, um, I wouldn't say racist, but um, hostile, I I could say that. Uh, <laughs> area of the city called me into his office one day and he says, McGee, which is what he always called me, McGee, uh, I'm going to support you for a judge. And I said, well, gee, thank you. Uh, he says, yeah, you're the only colored, colored guy I ever supported for anything. I said, well, geez, that's, that's great, thanks. <laughs> he said, but there's one thing I want to ask of you. And I thought, well, here it comes. And I'd, I'd been a federal prosecutor for a few years and I thought, well, how am I going to deal with this situation? Because I assume here comes the, the, the arm twisting. But what he said was, I want you to stay out of my ward. I don't want you to go to any ward meetings. And I said, I want to go to anyhow. So I said, well, that's fine. I'm, I'm happy to do that. And he said, yeah, see, I got an all Irish ward. Your name is McKee. I'm going to run you as an Irish guy. <laughs> so, and I can get you votes. But if you come into my ward and folks see that you're a colored guy, one, you're not going to get any votes. And I'm going to lose my ward share. So you got to stay out of my ward. He said, oh, so I'll be happy to do that. So I, I got 800 votes out of his ward. In the next few, several days, people were calling me saying, McKee, Ted, how in the hell did you get 800 votes out of that board? The first time someone called, unfortunately, I was honest, and I told them that story. Then I thought, you know, I could have some fun here. So everybody else who called, there were about three or four people who called, including the person who won the mayoral election that year. I said, well, you know, I went to the board meeting, and I read some carefully selected excerpts from the Federalist Papers, and I think it resonated with the... <laughs> With the committee people. But, but anyhow, that's one small example in my life, but it shows you how incredibly arbitrary electing judges um, can be. The key to having a fair and impartial judiciary is not uh, the process that we use necessarily, but building a public respect and understanding for what judges do in the rule, rule of law and, and valuing it. But it's not just building that amongst our elect uh, people who cast the vote. vote. I submit to you that unless our elected officials, those persons who in the so-called merit selection systems are responsible for appointing judges, unless there's a respect there and a valuing for the role of the judiciary and the importance of a fair and independent judiciary, we are in a lot of trouble. And absent that, I'd suggest to you, if we focus too much on the selection process, it's tantamount to just tinkering with the chairs on board the deck of the Titanic. We're not going to make any change. We're going to rearrange the furniture. I think the process that we have Having a good process is a necessary but not sufficient way of getting a fair and impartial judiciary. And unless that process rests on something, and I would submit that's the public respect for what we do, it's on a very, very shaky foundation. Oh, thank you, Judge McGee. <laughs> <laughs> um, does anybody want to respond to that? I, I'd just like to make a, a comment or two about what Judge McGee said. Um, you know, the, 
I don't think there's any question that the federal system works better, not perfectly, and I don't think anybody would say that there, there are no politics in the federal selection process, but there are checks and balances along the way, and, and for a long time, most presidents, most, by far most presidents, uh, would rely on, uh, they, they knew who they wanted to nominate, the, they got input from the two senators from the, the state, both of whom generally had committees, uh, to determine whether the candidate was really, uh, these were the right candidates to put forward. And then the ABA Selection Committee, or uh, the Committee on Judicial Selection, and I served on it for a number of years, uh, would do an interview with whomever seemed to emerge from that, a very detailed interview, an FBI uh, check, and, uh, and then a report to the president uh, from the ABA on whether the person was uh, highly qualified, qualified, or not qualified. And in every instance I saw, when there was a recommendation that came out from the ABA that said, sorry, uh, Mr. President, but this, this candidate just is not qualified to sit on the district court or one of our appellate courts, uh, that was respected by the president. In every instance, it was respected. Now, the problem with the state judiciary is, uh, what is it, a five? I think the big problem is uh, a five-letter word, which is money. Um, it, I think, will shock you to know that in the last run-up, the 2015 election for Supreme Court justices, the amount of money that was raised was $21 million that went into to um, funding candidates, $21 million. Uh, 15 million were raised by the candidates themselves. There was gray money, there was dark money. I mean, you know, it's the, the idea, and I don't blame the judges for the, 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 the individuals who were running for the appellate seats for the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. This was the system. Uh, nobody knew who they were. Uh, nobody knows who any of the judges are that are running for election. Um, and this was the game they were in, so they raised money. And of course, where does the money come from? It comes from special interest groups who think, whether it's right or wrong, but they think that they can influence how judges decide cases um, and that they, this judge will be likely to be much more receptive to their policy interests than some other judge. And that's why you get $21 million getting put into the, into the election. On the trial level, uh, in, in many ways it's even worse. Never, no one knows who the 15 or 20 trial judges are who are running. Uh, and, and it's not so much a problem with, many, uh, with money there, it's how well you did when you drew your ballot position and what your name was. And uh, similar to Judge McKee, I remember uh, one year there was a a very popular and famous nightclub owner in Philadelphia named Frank Palumbo. And uh, everybody loved uh, Mr. Palumbo. So there was a fellow running for a trial judge seat whose name was Palumbo. And he was the only one in that uh, election who had been rated unqualified by the Philadelphia Bar Association. Of course, he came in first. <laughs> uh, he was the, he came in number one uh, in in this. So he also had the first ballot position. He did. He had both. But um, and and the other problem I think that Judge McKee talks about is one that um, Judge Spaeth, who, who many of us revere and who wrote this wonderful book, The Constitution's Vision of a Just Society. I remember him telling us once that when he ran statewide. He would uh, go to these meetings, and I think you were referring to this, Ted, and um, people would come up to him and say, uh, so judge, how would you vote on this particular issue? And the judge, Judge Spaeth, would say, well, I, I really can't talk about that. I'm not permitted in Pennsylvania to tell you how I would vote, and I would have to know the facts and the law. And the person would look at him and give him a wink and say, <laughs> okay, now really, how would you vote on this? And Judge Spaeth said he found himself being winked at all across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. <laughs> so real, problem, very common, very real common. problems with this system. You wait. Okay, okay, we're going to change gears um, a little bit. Um, this is for Bob Heim as a litigator in federal court and state court and actually a, and as a, a passionate um, 
advocate for fair and impartial courts. Um, can you talk um, a little bit about public perception of the courts? And Judge Randell really gave us a, a start by talking about one of the surveys that's out now. Yeah, I, I think the surveys are fascinating, particularly the Annenberg uh, survey, and I think all of you have that in, in your package. Um, it's no surprise, I think, to anyone in this audience that uh, in various surveys, I think there have been three or four in the last couple of years, uh, the judiciary always ranks the highest in terms of respect and the other two um, uh, the other two bodies, the legislature or the executive, the, the judiciary gets much better marks for competence and, and, um, and, and just integrity and uh, it just uh, uh, does very, very well. Um, but, you know, given the state of affairs, why wouldn't you come out that way? But the, um, you know, my, my own view is that uh, the perception of the judiciary has eroded in recent years. Um, uh, I think, um, you know, some people think it started with Bush v. Gore, where the five R's came one way and the five, four D's came the other way, but I, I don't think so. I think the country got past uh, any, of the, any of that uh, kind of, uh, accusations of, of political bias, and, and we, we survived that reasonably well. Um, but, uh, but in recent years, you know, the, the references to Obama judges and Bush judges and the like, despite uh, our Chief Justice's, I thought, valiant effort to speak out publicly, which is always hard, I think, for a, a justice or a Chief Justice to do, but d despite that, I think, uh, there is a sense, um, and I think it is supported by the Annenberg survey that you have in your package, that the, um, the, the respect for the judiciary has, has eroded somewhat. Um, you now see candidates for the presidency suggesting that we enlarge the Supreme Court to, uh, from nine to, I think, 14, or term limits for appellate judges or Supreme Court uh, justices. And while that may have floated around before, I don't really remember it being talked about as, as much as it is. Um, and uh, I think Judge Rendell mentioned the, the survey response in Annenberg, but the one that troubled me most, the response that you have in your package that troubled me most was the one uh, response where half of the respondents uh, said that uh, they thought judges did not rise above their own um, political biases or personal beliefs in deciding cases. That really troubled me because that's really the, 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 the heart of, of an independent judiciary, that judges will do just exactly that, that they're beholden only, only to the law. Um, and I, I think, um, I think that's a very troubling result, and I would guess that it's pretty much consistent among all, the, all of the surveys that get done nationally. Uh, it's very worrisome to me because um, I think uh, Dr. Gutman uh, said it pretty well. You know, it's, it's not enough. It really is not enough for, um, to, for judges to be fair. Uh, it's, just as important that, that our courts and our judges, our justices be perceived as being fair. And when that doesn't happen, I think we all lose something. Uh, so I, I think, um, I think we're, we're in a darker spot right now than we have been in a long time with regard to the perception of the judiciary. And, how we're gonna deal with that and how we're gonna confront that um, is something that I think should be important to everybody here. Peter, do you wanna respond or not? Well, I just kind of pick up on that. I'm not sure the public understands how incredibly difficult it is, it is for us to do our, our jobs. There have been a couple of cases that I've had decide that came out in a way that were totally was antithetical for the way I thought a quote just result would um, forced me to go, but the law was clear, the precedents were clear. Fortunately, I had no seniority. I could assign the opinion to myself and keep it very, very narrow. 
and not um, did too much what I would consider damage in the writing of it. But I did not like the result, but I had no choice. Uh, and I remember, I think I'd been on the court maybe only two months, and one of my colleagues came down who uh, shared my concerns about the death penalty. And she had just been on a panel and decided that there was a uh, death penalty case, and she had to vote to uphold the sentence of death. She sat down on a sofa, and I didn't know her all that well at the time. We became incredibly good friends after that. She actually began to cry. And she said, you know, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to sleep tonight. I, I, I hate what I just did, but I've, um, I had no choice. And we talked for a little bit about it. She knew that I shared her concerns about the death penalty. And I've had those experiences myself, in one case where I had to uh, do an opinion overturning the grant of, a writ of habeas, because I just thought there was no intellectually honest way to say this person is you're going to have the death penalty that, that, that doesn't apply here. And, and the public really doesn't quite get that. So when I hear things like that survey, uh, it really is disheartening because that is the hardest thing we have to do is try to be faithful to that rule of law. And, and, and the, the borderline shifts, obviously, and in some areas you have more leeway than others, depending on the large uh, interstices, how big the interstices are between the law and the statutes that control. But for the most part, I think, with any court, the Supreme Court or any circuit court, if you take the quote, most conservative and the most liberal person on that court and gave them a sample of 100 cases, in probably 99% of the time you get everyone agreeing because the law is pretty clear as to what you had to do, but the public doesn't see that aspect of it. They see the aspect where there might be a, a political divide or a case that gets sensationalized, and it's, it's oftentimes very disheartening that I just don't think the, the folks get it or appreciate it. And all the more um, reason that what the Rendell Center is doing is important so people can understand really the role of the judge and that you're not there, Judge McGee, to, you know, just to say what you personally feel. Okay, let's, we're going to move on um, for a question for Judge Cohn uh, Jubilier. Um, this audience is more knowledgeable than most groups, but even so, my hunch is that many of us still struggle with, with what... Um, judicial accountability means, accountability to whom, accountability to what. And so if you could talk about that and also briefly talk about the tension between judicial independence and judicial accountability. Yes, thank you very much. And it's a real honor to be here with this esteemed panel. And of course, thank you, Judge Rendell, for um, inviting us here and, and your staff for putting this together. Um, discussing such a broad question and recognizing the level and depth of expertise of this audience is, is very challenging. Um, I was elected, um, my only experience has been in state court. I was elected in a partisan um, statewide election in 2001 and then stood, we call it standing, for um, a merit retention in 2011 and then of course have um, an opportunity in a couple years hopefully to stand again. So. Um, let me first put a, a little context to the conversation. Um, and as uh, President Gutman said before, approximately 90% of the United States judicial business is handled by state courts. And approximately nine out of 10 state court judges face voters in some type of election. Pennsylvania, like other states, began with appointed judges and did not elect judges until 1850. Around this time, there was a national movement to judicial elections, arguably part of the Jacksonian era of democracy. You know, a distrust of unrepresentation, fear of unaccountable government officers, and a belief that judges could function as a check and balance of the other branches, only if independent of them and not appointed by them. Um, and you can think of this as institutional um, independence, as uh, Dean Levy had talked about. And in fact, early state judges nationwide um, did not use, um, curtailed their use of judicial review in order to avoid conflict with legislatures from the founding until about 1830s. Um, and so there was a concern about judges being beholden, if you will, to those who appointed them. Um, after Pennsylvania went to their election system, debate began shortly thereafter and has continued, of course, until today, not only about who initially selects the judges and through what process, and um, to continue with an Alexander Hamilton reference, who can be in the room where it happens, um, <laughs> but also how long judges should serve 
and how they will be reselected or retained. Um, re -sele selecting and retaining a fair and impartial judiciary requires um, competent, qualified judges who are able to interpret and apply the law free of improper influence, political or other pressures or inducements, kind of decisional independence, um, while not exceeding the proper limits of judicial authority, whatever those are, and which can be referred to as accountability. And the goal, I guess, has been to find um, and maintain um, or a balance to maintain public confidence in a fair and impartial judiciary. The federal courts and some state courts like Pennsylvania have chosen different systems to meet that goal. More than 10 years ago, I was in line uh, to vote in a municipal election and a woman came in um, saying very excited and passionately she was there to vote that day because she wanted to vote to be able to keep voting for judges. Now at the time, as I mentioned, there has been, you know, obviously discussion about changing the system in Pennsylvania and she thought it was on the ballot. Of course, it was not. But um, that story really sticks with me because when you also look at surveys and you see the state of our states, the public by and large wants to be able to continue to elect their judges. And um, given some of the concerns, um, you know, and, and I see there are both advantages and disadvantages to the systems that we have. But um, let me just um, throw out a couple ideas, since I'm the state elected judge. Um, as was mentioned before, um, elections are opportunities. And when I traveled around the state, one of the things I did when I was, um, I would go to senior centers and you can't go in and be, you know, um, as an, ask for election, but I uh, play the piano and sing. So I would go in and do sing-alongs. And in between, and, which they let me do, and then in between each one, I would talk about Commonwealth Court. How important <laughs> Commonwealth Court is. Because how would, they didn't understand, but it is the intermediate appellate court in Pennsylvania that impacts individuals um, with regard to the rates they pay for utilities, um, zoning, education, taxation, um, the environment. They didn't understand that. So it was an opportunity to educate them. And the Pennsylvania Supreme Court has been um, very, um, you know, has developed, well, the Commission on Judicial Independence, whose large measure is to educate the public works with the Rendell Foundation and others, as well as then um, educating the public um, judges. Now we have mandatory judicial education to educate the judges about the code of judicial conduct, which requires fair and impartial judiciary. Um, and in a way, there's a um, respect for the public in an elective system. So you can think about it in the sense that when you're looking at these polls, and it's very disturbing when the public doesn't understand and appreciate how judges make decisions, the decision-making process, the kinds of um, agonizing that judges do um, on all the courts when you're faced with legal principles that you must apply and in an individual factual scenario may not um, appear to be um, you know, consistent with your personal beliefs but which you are by your oath required to convey. And um, so one way is to bring the public into it and if you have an elective system you are forced in some ways. There's a requirement that you need to keep educating the public because you need them to participate, to be knowledgeable um, when they make their selections, to understand what judges do and who the candidates are. Um, and so it, it does give that opportunity. Um, finally, I would just um, say that um, as a state court judge, and I also share, I'm, I'm a student of Dean Levy's, I went to the um, um, 
Duke um, Masters um, in Judicial um, Studies, I guess. Um, yes, M Masters of Judicial Studies a few years ago and was introduced to all of these metrics and how judges, you know, how the um, various um, studies there are and the way they look at them to try to understand statistically how judges make decisions and whatever. And um, I agree with everything he said, but um, I was also intrigued by an article that was entitled, um, Professionals or Politicians, the Uncertain Empirical Case for an Elected Rather Than Appointed Judiciary by um, Troy Galati and Eric Posner in 2007, describing the results of an empirical study that they did, which found that elected judges write many more opinions than appointed judges, and from some of the metrics they looked at, did not appear to be less independent than appointed judges. So we have our work cut out for us, but. Um, Thank you. We didn't really get into judicial accountability, and in, um, but I, since we have a number of questions which deal with uh, the terms and tenure of judges, I think we'll, we'll go into that. By the way, when I was uh, preparing some questions, I decided to Google the word tenure because I didn't want to keep using it over and over again. And when I Googled it, one of the words for tenure was dynasty. So I thought, well, that was interesting. So I want to start then with Judge McKee in terms of dynasty because basically federal judges serve for life. There have been a number of suggestions about changing that, um, and some people have asked about that, whether that would be a threat to judicial independence if we were to have term limits. And then following what you're going to say, I would like to hear from Judge Renee uh, Cone Jubilier about changing the way uh, the retention elections, whether we should change the way the retention elections are in the state, particularly with an idea towards uh, fair and impartial courts. And one of you wrote, how can, for Judge uh, Cone Jubilier, how can you roll, rule on a hot button case in a way that's an unpopular, in a way that's unpopular, knowing that you're going to stand for retention next year. So let's start with you, Judge McKee, and then we're going to go to Judge Cohn. I, I get nervous when I hear people talk about judicial accountability because I don't know what that means. I don't know what it looks like. That's so, why we were hoping we were going to hear a definition from all of you. Well, I don't like that. I don't, I don't like the concept, frankly. I, and, and this may not go over real well. I don't think judges should be accountable to anything other than the law and our judicial colleagues. Um, we clearly are not there to take the votes of the public. We clearly should not be accountable to the voting majority. I'll give you one, hopefully, quick example of this. One of the first arguments, well, it wasn't one of the first arguments. Two weeks after September 11, we had a case um, come before a panel that I was on with, with two of my colleagues. And the issue was whether or not a recent change in an immigration law was constitutional. The change prohibited someone, precluded someone, who was an illegal um, uh, alien from getting an automatic hearing uh, to be able to show that they weren't a risk of flight or danger to the community pending their removal. So in other words, once the order of removal was entered, between the order, time of the order of removal was entered and the actual removal, the, prior to this law, the person was able to show they weren't a danger, weren't a risk of flight, they could be at liberty prior to the time they were removed. They were removed, the amendment did away with that. Um, presumption of a, um, a hearing. It meant that people were being detained, and there was a challenge to the constitutionality of that. And I remember when I read the briefs, I, was, I thought that the law was unconstitutional, but I was very concerned that this argument was occurring two weeks after September 11 because of the climate. Um, we went into, and I, 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 I'm always prepared for it, like to think I'm always prepared for argument and for conference, but I went into the conference with outlines of my outlines of my outlines, thinking that I was gonna to have to conduct like a 30 minute filibuster to get a second vote on my position. To my uh, surprise, I went first, I was the most senior person. The other two judges totally agreed, and two or three minutes afterwards, I was interrupted and just said, so Ted, you want to first? And I said, yeah. And there was no, um, really no discussion. We all three of us agreed. We circulate our opinions before they're filed and then after they're filed to make sure that the, our presidential opinions, to see whether or not a majority of the court or any colleagues on the court have any suggestions or comments or want to vote for rehearing. There was not one vote for rehearing. And I was proud, and to this moment, I think I've never been prouder of being a federal judge than I was then. With all the emotion that was out there, with all the tension and trauma and fear, we were able to look at the law and determine whether or not um, the underlying decision was correct. Now, 
the the Ninth Circuit had the same issue. They went the other. They went the same way, actually. Steve ran her with the opinion. The Supreme Court reversed the Ninth Circuit. Said, Thank you, not us. So that that ended up not be, that ended up not being the controlling law. But at this day, I'm incredibly proud of that. Now, if we put accountability into that, I am guessing that would have been a very, very unpopular decision because of the emotion. And I can go back in history through the laws of miscegenation and everything else. The the um, um, uh, laws growing out of Jehovah's Witnesses and military service and whether or not they should stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Very unpopular decisions that the courts, because we're not accountable to the body public, have been able to just focus on the legal issue. So again, I think we, we have to be accountable to the law. How you measure that is a problem. We have to be accountable to our colleagues. I do not think we should be accountable to the electorate. And to the extent we start going down that road, we're in a very very dangerous road, and by definition, I think that is the antithesis of judicial independence. So you're saying that life, lifetime appointment helps judicial independence. Absolutely. Let Absolutely. me tell you what um, uh, somebody, somebody wrote here is, what do you think about limiting the Supreme Court terms to a fixed number of years so that no president has an undue influence on the future of the court, and that as the Constitution, those justices could move to lower courts after their Supreme Court term ends? Well, they can kind of do that now. Informally, anyhow, I think if you start tinkering with those kinds of things, it increases the it, it, it further increases the politicalization of the court because people start then running on who they and to the extent unfortunately where they're now, but people start running on uh, how many Supreme Court picks they will get, and it's a certainty that they're going to get the picks. Uh, the shirtless kick bubbling up now, which is incredibly unfortunate. Anything that puts politics in the middle of a judicial consideration, where it starts putting to the public who should be elected president or anybody else based upon who that person will put on the court and focuses it. It's going to be there as a subject. Mm -hmm. To the extent that that is focused, I think we're, we're in dangerous territory. I, would, I don't think it's a good idea. OK, as to the state courts then, as, as you know, we have now a retention election, did Judge uh, Cohn, Jubilee, and Bob want to comment on, 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 on that? Well, and I, um, I want to be very clear that I, I don't believe, I don't believe any state court judges think that they're accountable to public um, whim or what, that their decisions should be based on what the public, you know, thinks um, is, is appropriate at the time. And we have a code of judicial conduct that very clearly articulates that. Um, the, the decisions are based on the law. So there's an accountability, I suppose, to, to the law. Um, one of the things, and you talk about, when we try to think of it as merit retention in Pennsylvania, um, is how quickly um, is, is, the, is the judge doing the job efficiently? Is the ju judge doing the job consistent with their um, judicial obligations? And um, so, and, and it gives the public an opportunity um, to, um, to look at that and determine, and it, maybe it's m even more um, specific with uh, local judges, but um, statewide um, to do that. The um, interesting whether or not, or to what extent, the um, upcoming retention election affects judicial decision making. I know Dean Levy mentioned some studies, and um, there has there was a, a recent study, and it, again, you know, it's difficult to sort of figure this out. I know on my own experience is that, and first of all, when um, you're on an appellate court, you make decisions as a group. And so the um, uh, ability of your colleagues, of course, as well, to be involved in the decision making would, to the extent there would be an influence, would re uh, you know, reduce the um, ability, that, that decision making. Um, they, are, they have seen in studies that there are more um, minority opinions, perhaps, written in that retention year so that judges who may be up for retention can explain their position in greater detail. Um, and um, so I, there are, as Dean Levy said, as um, Judge McKee has expressed, always going to be times when judges must ex exercise their courage and show their integrity and make decisions that are difficult. And that's what the public predominantly expects. That's what the judges expect of each other. And I think it's what 
um, the, the, pub the public demands and requires. And so, um, yes, you have to make the tough decisions knowing that you may lose your job when you're a state court judge. Yeah, but well. that's, it goes to character. And yeah. Bob, let's bring in, in Bob Hyman. You yeah. can, because of time, you can either respond to the retention issue or you can throw out any suggestions that you think for improving either, um, um, improving um, the selection system or the public perception of the courts? Well, my, my experience is limited to Pennsylvania, but I think um, and this may be an anti-democratic view with a small d. I think retention elections are pretty much worthless. Um, you know, if you look at the history of uh, retention elections in Pennsylvania, I can only remember one in which uh, a Supreme Court justice was not retained over the last 40, 50 years. And it's pretty much always uh, a yes vote on retention. I, I don't think retention elections do much. Um, I, I think that um, uh, uh, I, I agree with Judge Hubel here that people always uh, respond in polls to say um, yes, and, and the argument's always made by pro-election people that you know, you're going to take away people's right to vote. Uh, people always say, yes, don't take away my right to vote. But if you ask them whether they'd like to be able to vote on which system they'd like, they always answer yes to that too. So you get a lot of yes answers as to both. And, and, um, and just to go back to one quick story, I remember some years ago a friend of mine came back from court and was kind of sad and I said, what's wrong? And he said, um, I was sitting there and the judges came out and, um, uh, and I was waiting to argue, but when I saw the judges, my client, I turned to my client and I said, wow, one of these judges got a lot of campaign money from the opposing lawyer. And he looked at me and said, well, why didn't you give money? <laughs> well, that says it all. Uh, Ju <laughs> Judge McKee, uh, as a wrap-up because of the time, do you want to throw in any suggestions? I, I just, I'll, I'll give one quick pretentious story, which um, probably is what Bob said. I was on the court for 11 years, court of common peace, so I did run for retention. And during that retention, I was nervous, and I was getting, getting ready to go to all these board meetings and go to buy tickets for the Democrats and the Republicans for the dinner, and a colleague of mine was doing the same thing. She was going crazy. Uh, the, the judge, who was my administrative judge, I was speaking with him, and he said, what are you doing all this for? And I said, well, you know, I've got this retention election coming up. So he said, Ted, no matter what you do, a third of the people are going to vote no, two-thirds of the people are going to vote yes, you're going to get retained. So I didn't know anything. I gave no money, bought no tickets, went to no ward meetings. My friend, on the other hand, must have put out 15 grand going to ward meetings and buying tickets. She got two-thirds yes, I got two-thirds yes. <laughs> I think they're probably as useless as Bob thinks they are. Okay, a second wrap-up. Uh, do, do you want to uh, throw out any uh, suggestions that you've been thinking of for, for improving the systems? Well, um, I think that from the stories we've heard, um, the, and currently the, the system isn't going to be changing, I don't think, in Pennsylvania anytime soon. People, um, for whatever reason, find it important to vote for their judges. And in a way, I think that um, knowing that, the Rendell Center, the Commission on Judicial Independence, that the combination of um, educating the public, educating judges to make sure that they continue to understand their responsibility and um, know that ethic obligations, having a discipline system, which we do in Pennsylvania, um, where the members of the public, if there is a concern, first of all, can ask for recusal and also file complaints that are investigated. And um, so they can be assured of the, um, the, the, the judge's um, behavior, um, as well as, um, well, Okay. Yeah. Well, my sessions like this. My suggestion yeah. to Judge Randell is that we go on for another half hour because we have <laughs> great questions here. We have good here. questions. Well, uh, <laughs> we have a break for 15 minutes. So the people who didn't get their questions answered, why don't you just come up and I'm detain not, these people and ask your questions? I'd like yeah, to thank you. Thank you, panelists. Thank you so much.